Hello, I'm Tom Berlinson. It's hard to believe that it's been over 30 years since I played the title role in the movie The Man from Snowy River. Since then, I've continued to ride in the high country. Tonight's program is about a fearless horsewoman who grew up just down the road from the snowy, who beat the men at their own game. They breed them tough in those mountains, and Lee Woodgate's experiences have been epic. This is her story. Every single thing in life that happens to you is a learning experience. I'm very lucky that I've been brought up. You've got to work very, very hard for what you want. There had been a couple of female jump riders prior to Lee, but uh, Lee was just a natural. She'd had the perfect background. She's a girl from Bucken. Her father's one of the original mountain cattlemen, Grub Woodgate. I suppose in racing we talk about horses having a pedigree to race, and Lee certainly had the pedigree to race uh, and to be a jockey. To go to the next level of the jumping jockey, it's got to be probably nearly the most dangerous profession in the, in the world. Dad said to me, he said, who chose to do jumps racing? I said, I did. He said, who warned you against it? I said, you did. He said, get over it. It's up to you to get over it. Lee obtained a high profile doing the uh, commercial at the time for uh, the TAB. That sort of propelled her into the spotlight because she was attractive and she obviously was a very good young horse person. And uh, people latched onto Lee Woodgate and wanted to know what she was doing. Where did it all start? You know, where, did, where was the beginning with, with her relationship to horses? Buggin is a very small community, it's very close-knit. The families have known each other for generations. When Lee was born, Grub was disappointed that Lee wasn't a boy. He got over it. As time went on and her interest in horses grew, well, you know, things settled down. The son, Craig, he wasn't much interested in horses and that, and Lee was always mad keen on riding them, so Grub sort of probably took her under his wing. In a farming family, the boys are absolutely everything. But I was the apple of Dad's eye. Dad gave me the best childhood. He took me to all the shows, the Jim Carners, pony club events, bush racing. When I was 25 years of age, I rode in my first Cattleman's Cup in 1989. Bush racing, if you've seen the man from Snowy River, it's in rough terrain and they race through it like you're catching a mob of rumbies. Back in those times, it was a really unique time in bush racing. You had half a dozen riders that you could nearly guarantee would finish in the top six. Competitively, Lee had as much experience or more than most people, so you could guarantee that she was going to be in the mix there somewhere. Dad was a massive part of my life, especially with the bush racing. He just expected me to compete against the men on an equal basis. I was Dad's right-hand man with the cattle work, so they gave me a lot of respect. She was there to win, and she just went for it. You just got used to it and thought, well, if she's gonna fall off, she'll fall off and that's it. She'll either get back on or she won't, she'll end up in hospital. One 
one year at Mansfield coming down the hill there, this chestnut bloody flash went, <laughs> took, took me on the inside and straight up the bloody straight, and it was Lee, of course, like she, she rounded us up and we, didn't, we couldn't get near her. That, that was the year she won it. When I won the Great Mountain Race in 1990, I went flat out down the hill, and that is where I passed everybody. And I couldn't believe that I had won it, because no woman had won the race before. I said to him after it, I said, how did I do, Dad? He said, really good, Lee. He said, but the hard thing will be winning it next year. They'll all be out to beat you. It was never, ever good enough. There was always the next challenge. Jumps racing is something that we inherited from the mother country many hundreds of years ago. They used to call it steeple chasing, which people used to race from church steeple to church steeple, and it's virtually a race over two mile or more with obstacles on the way. South Australia and Victoria are the only states to have jumps racing. They go at an incredible speed of, say, 40 to 45 k's an hour. A lot of these fences have been lowered down to a brush fence to uh, make it a lot easier for horses to jump, and some horses respect them and some horses don't, so that can be a little bit difficult. It makes for fast jumping races, and quite often there can be accidents. He finally gets off his back past the 800. Olympic wins down, Casa boys down. It's a really controversial issue. There's passion on both sides. Jumps racing is inherently dangerous. It's dangerous for the horse, it's dangerous for the jockey, and that's because we have horses going over long distances, many hurdles, they tire, the jockeys are heavier, of course they're going to fall. I have never ridden a horse that doesn't want to jump. If it doesn't want to jump, it won't jump. A little bit quieter. Quieter? Slower, definitely. Over the jumps? When she decided, to take it up. The old jumps racing grub was horrified. He just said, you'll kill yourself. Dad was horrified a bit. I never took much notice. I thought I was invincible. It was rare for a female to be riding over the jumps. Racing's always looking for a star, whether it be equine or human. Being an attractive female, young, so determined, but having the ability to handle a horse from, from being a child. She was the perfect unit. She was watched pretty carefully at the time. My goal in jumps racing was to win the Grand National in England. I was very excited once she got going. There's only a certain amount of riders, but there's only a certain a handful that really have that sort of talent and uh, she had enormous talent. One fence left to jump in the steeplechase and this lady rider aboard Winter Cole comes to the last one with a handy break, jumped it safely, Winter Cole for um, Miss Lee Woodgate. The first race I rode in, I was lucky enough to win it. Great ride by this lady as she comes down to the post to win on Winter Cole, leading all the way to win. And I thought, how easy is this money? How long has this been going on? First ride, win. Second ride, win. Third ride, win. How good's that? On the 1st of July 1994 was my ninth race ride. I had to have 10 rides to ride in the city. We were actually going to Hamilton, where Lee was on a horse called Winter Coal, which uh, she had one on previously. The race, I did watch on Terry. I think I was in the pub. I think we went over to the pub and watched it over there. Now they're all in. We're set for the steeplechase. Down there, it's always raining, so the ground would have been quite heavy. Field. Here's the first jump, and Winter Cole, the top weight, takes off beautifully and leads by three parts. He had top weight at the time, which I think was 71 and a half. The track was fairly heavy. 
jumped faultlessly throughout. And the leader as they approached the next jump was Winter Cole. She was up near the lead and it wasn't far from home. And the leader, Kiss of Life, he had a good look at it, so did Winter Cole, who was passed. And he tired and I can remember taking off and going over and then he buckled on landing and I fell off. Last the inside, Winter Cole's lost the rider there. The top is gone. I've never seen the footage of my race fall, but I know that I went headfirst into the ground. And for her to be thrown over the other side of the fence and then for the horses to gallop over it, and that's, see, the jockeys behind couldn't see it. And I think that's when they galloped on top of it. And I still see, and it was terribly graphic and disturbing, but her body actually lifted off the ground as, as a horse collected as she was lifted probably uh, one and a half feet or something off the, off the ground and then dumped again. So when you watched it, you thought, well, it's impossible for her to survive that. Lee Woodgate being attended to there by the ambulance men. The horse that Lee came off, Winter Cole, escaped injury. Lee was unconscious, so then she was uh, airlifted to Melbourne. was sickening more than anything. Nobody knew whether she was going to live or die or what the outcome would be. And I just came home and I left a note for Grub and said, I'm off to Melbourne. I'm on my way to Melbourne. Lee's had a terrible accident. Being in a coma was like I was underwater. It was like that I was being sucked down. Every single cell in my body was screaming out for breath and my brain couldn't tell my body how to breathe and I felt like I was drowning. I was being sucked down into a deep, dark hole. By objective criteria, she suffered a very severe brain injury. Given the sort of injury that, that Lee had and looking at the scans and looking at the unconsciousness, there was a prospect that, that she wouldn't survive the injury. I was a mess when it happened, a complete mess, because hearing a neurosurgeon say to you, there isn't much hope, and if she does come out of the coma, she's likely to be a vegetable. It wasn't until I relaxed, it wasn't until I stopped fighting that I was then able to breathe. When that breath came, I thought, now I'm going to survive. My injuries were coma 17 days, broke both shoulders, punctured both lungs, broke my jaw in four places, bottom teeth wired in, five ribs, my left hip, my third optic nerve in my left eye died. How can you feel like uh, disastrous? It was tragic. You see someone that's so full of life and bubbly and nearly um, that love life so much and for that to happen to them, uh, you know, it's just, your heart sinks to your feet. Grub didn't come down with me initially when I first went down there. Later on, he did come down. He took one look at Lee and he just said, she's buggered. She'll never be any good. I was the apple of his eye and all his dreams came shattering down around him when I had the accident. He said, you were my favourite, Lee, till the accident. Now you're the biggest disappointment in my life. He said, I was the one to make you who you are. He said, your life's finished. He said, it is over. That drove me to work even harder to get as good as I can get. I think now, the way I had to think so that I didn't get bitter, because bitterness would eat me up, I had to think, how lucky am I to have this accident happen to me. How lucky am I 
to have everything taken away and to have had to work on absolutely everything. She had to learn to talk. She had to learn to eat, wash her face, clean her teeth, blow her nose, just everything. Eric came into the hospital to see me and I said to Eric, I said, Eric, I said, if I get a clearance to ride, I said, will you give me the chance to get back to riding? He said, yes, Lee, I will, thinking he never would have to do it. At this stage, she was just getting to a wheelchair. She hadn't re virtually got much more than sitting up in bed. And she said, uh, Eric, you know, she said, I'm definitely going to get back. She said, I just hope you'll give me a go. She said, this is not, this is only a setback. And uh, she said, now, won't you, Eric, won't you, Eric? And I'm thinking, I couldn't believe the determination. And I thought, well, all I can do is humour her. And I said, yes, Lee, I'll definitely give you a go. But in my own heart, you know, I never thought that she would be able to ride again. I had to look at my body as a broken object. I was in hospital for six months as an inpatient. Their mum lived with me for an, a year to teach me how to become independent. And then I bought a house and she said, you're on your own. I had to learn how to like myself again because when I looked at myself in the mirror, I hated the person I was. My mouth was twisted and my left eye was closed shut and I had to learn how to like that person again. And I had to put in all that hard work to change myself to a person that I would like. She says her life's in Melbourne. She's dedicated to the therapy that she does and she's quite determined that she's going to be 100% in her own mind. I'd set the alarm for two o'clock in the morning and I would get up and I would stretch for half an hour. I'd go back to bed. I'd get up at four o'clock in the morning. I'd then stretch for 15 minutes. Then I would go back to bed and I'd get up at 5.30 and I'd be ready to be down the gym at quarter past six to start work because it was 24 hours a day. Dad never believed that I would get back to 100%, but as the years went by, he could see the hard work that I put in. He was very proud of me. He believed that I could get back to normality. Yeah, that's better. How's the right ankle going? Now I'm like the million dollar girl because of all the operations I've had and all the different treatments I have tried. So we're just gonna do the one so you can get, get your arm straight, straight out. Yeah. Yeah. Making the decision to allow Lee to get back into horse work was pretty complex because there were certainly risks and if she'd had another fall or injured herself then it would have felt terrible. We ultimately agreed that each, each small step was going to be monitored and approved, and Lee was prepared to take the risks, and I guess we had to accept that. And happily, I mean, happily accept it, because that's what she wanted to do. I think Lee is determined to get back to where she was before her accident, but also horses are, it's a lifestyle and she was a professional. She lived, she breathed, she slept, she ate horses. Most of us in the horse industry are like that. And Lee just wants to be back with her horses. I had a call from Lee Woodgate and, and um, she was looking for some support from the racing industry um, to help her try and achieve her goals of, uh, you know, getting to the point where she could ride a horse, you know, on a track. Um, as part of her rehab. Four times a day I'd call David Charles. He would get very, very sick of me. And uh, he said, Lee, he said, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? I said, I want to ride track work. He said, what? 
she drove me nuts in a good way, but I, I just knew spending time with her that that's what she, she needed. And we got to the point where we could confidently ring Eric and ask him if he could help us, and, and his first answer was yes. I was very dubious, and we just made sure we had something very safe, that the last thing we want was anything to go wrong. Finally, that day when we drove up to Eric Musgroves, I mean, everyone was very nervous because um, we were hoping it was going to go well. And, um, you know, I think it was, very, it was very emotional for everyone. I think the first thing when you see Lee walking towards you is you think, how is she going to get on that horse? She does have a very different gait through her injuries. You look at Lee and think, how are you going to have the strength to stand on one leg? And remember, it's a left side that is the uh, damaged side. You've got to get that up, up into the stirrup and swing your right leg over. How are you going to do it? feel you never lose, it's just a natural thing. She got on the horse and rode straight away and... Riding track work in the first thing in the morning when the sun's coming up, there is only you and the horse and you're in sync with one another. There's no better feeling. I guess over the years she's appreciated that she's not quite as young as she used to be and racing is not going to be an option for her but riding was always her goal and in many ways it's been fantastic that she's been able to achieve that goal uh, even though it took her I guess 15 or 16 years from the time of injury to when she actually got back to a reasonable level of riding. Grub would be terrible bloody proud of her now if he was still about with what she's achieved. <laughs> he might have had to eat his words. But I've got two to go. We've got old box for No, I'm going to have a snake then. She still thinks of Buggin as home, even though she is in Melbourne, she, she, she still thinks of it as home. Dad died of cancer nine years ago, and I went into the hospital and Mum said, Lee, tell him anything you want to tell him. And I said, Dad, you are the one to make me the person who I am today. I said, thank you. I said, I love you. And I said, I promise to look after the family. And uh, then he passed away. Tell me a bit of mucking about to get him the right length. Yeah. Peter Sandy is like a brother to me. He, he's always been a huge part of my life. Get on from there, can you? Yeah. been riding track work for a few years now and I rang Peter up and I said, I'm ready to go over a jump. Right. Yep. He said, oh, yes. I said, you're not scared, are you, Pete? And he said, no. He said, are you? I said, no. <laughs> Feeling all right, Eddie? Yep. <laughs> you sort of tiptoeing around and you're thinking in the back of your mind, God, she'll come off and do something serious and hurt herself again and that. But that's what she wants to do. That's all she lives for, so you've got to give her the opportunity. Remember to get your bum up out of the saddle. It would surprise me that Lee would want to get a horse over an obstacle again, but it wouldn't shock me. With her determination, um, I suppose it's trying to pick up where you left off. They've said, Lee, you're stupid, you're mad, you're crazy. Why would you want to do that? As I was saying, as he can, as into it, the last couple of strides, sit down and drive him in with your bum. Yeah. To reach goals, you've got to be able to look in the mirror and face your biggest fears. Yeah. It's taken 18 years to get to this point of going over a jump, and it feels absolutely fantastic. Each little step you take, you get further and towards your goal. I've reached the goal that I set out to do. The whole world's opening up for me now. If you want to put your money on anyone to get back to where she almost was before, you'd put your money on Lee Woodgate. 
She's an inspiration in a very, very tough world. You know, a hard school of knocks, racing is. No quarters given, there's no free kicks, but uh, the world of racing admires everything that Lee Woodgate has done and to where she is now and to where she's going to be in the future. Now I just enjoy living life. Living life and knowing at the end of each day when I put my head on the pillow that I've given it my very best shot and I haven't left a stone unturned. Oh, 